join us on www.patreon.com forward slash raw pet medics uh, going across the bottom of your screen now um and we're going to have a little bit of a chat afterwards um we've got the pleasure of dr judy for 45 and i don't think we should waste any more time than to jump <laughs> straight into uh asking some wonderful questions uh so and i think nick you've got the first first question to ask ready so uh, just the first one uh, dr judy morgan it's so lovely to have you here that's fantastic we're really looking forward to seeing you uh for for the expo uh in the uk in may i'm not sure if you're doing that live or online but it'd be great to have you there to i share will that be there <laughs> wow okay great so we can hug and do all that stuff that'll be amazing wonderful wonderful listen um we we've actually done a survey of every person on the planet all eight billion people we actually found two who hadn't heard of you so we got them to come and join <laughs> this evening so for their sake if you could just tell us who you are and what you do just uh, just a little one minute two minute <laughs> intro for those two people for those two people okay well i'm yes, dr please. judy morgan and uh i have been a veterinarian for over 38 years i retired from clinical practice and sold my two practices in november of 2020 so that i could move south to north carolina from new jersey uh and be near my daughter and most particularly my granddaughter but we'll, we'll throw Gwen in there too. <laughs> <laughs> because she's listening, <laughs> because she's listening. uh but my two-year-old granddaughter is the love of my life so i've had to transition away Away from clinical practice into um, more online education and also our online naturally healthy pets uh, product web store. And I, I actually like this because I'm able to educate a, a much broader audience and reach a ton more people than I could in daily practice in the clinic. So, so that's what I'm up to. That's what we do. I've written four books and uh, hopefully have two coming out this year if, if the stars align. Oh, two at the same time, Judy. You're a sucker for well, punishment. Well, one of them I wrote a year and a half ago. I just needed to do the last chapter, which was really dumb to sit on it for that long. But here we are. <laughs> yeah. Does it get easier writing books? It does. Um, although if I was writing one like yours with that much research and that many footnotes, no. <laughs> yeah. Do you, you, you enjoy it, though, because your books are, are extremely digestible. They are extremely popular as well. They top the they top the kind of lists of canine nutrition books all the time, particularly your first one there, the bottom right one. What was the name of that with the three speech bubbles? Uh, was it you? Oh, you the, the uh, From Needles to Natural Learning Holistic yes, Pet that's Healing. The one. Yes, that was Yeah, the so one. that one's getting uh, revamped this year. Okay, oh, very good. Okay, cool. Yeah. Good. And you have also got a lot of online courses coming on as well. I see it pops up in my feed all the time. You guys are very busy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are, and one of the things with Dr. Judy Yu, it's drjudyu.com, um, we love to have courses from other holistic veterinarians, trainers, whoever wants to send us things. So we have some of uh, Dr. Nick's courses on there on uh, raw feeding and feeding bones. And so we are always looking for people who have great content, who want to get it out to more people and share through our platform. Um, and we do have a new course, which I really hope is being launched next week. Uh, we've been uh, really working on this for about a year and a half, which is a hospice and palliative care course. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think mm. I, it is so, so needed. So uh, keep tuned for that because that should be, should go live, we think, in the next week. That sounds Finally. good. Great. Good luck yeah. with that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. That's good. Yeah. Um, so um, you had mentioned, uh, Judy, uh, I couldn't help but uh, when we were sharing the fact that you were coming on, people get very, very excited. But even you came on and you got quite excited because you were mentioning that uh, you had this case study in the background uh, of this uh, dog that you wanted. To, and it was, it was a hot topic of what you want to talk about because it's exactly one of the main topics we wanted to talk to you about. We want to get the kind of what's going on across the pond and how you guys deal with some topics. Do you want to just, uh, the best nutrition for puppies and kittens was the first question Brian was itching to, to get out. Will we just start with that bit and then we'll lead into the case study of, sure. of, of your little pup? Um, so from my perspective, I think that we should be buying puppies and kittens who come from raw fed parents because yeah. they're less mm. likely to, so really when you're looking for that new pet, and this is part of what the first book that I'm, have ready to go. Um, when you're looking for that new pet, look at the parents because the health of your pet starts 
before they're even conceived with what the health of the parents is. Um, so that's the first thing. And then I really like to see them weaned directly onto raw feeding uh, because the, the health is going to be so much better unless you screw it up with a lot of other things that we'll talk about <laughs> because even the best nutrition in the world you can screw that up if you do enough other things wrong <laughs> mm, no doubt that's a fact so but even all of our dogs um they're they're rescues and they come in with tons of allergies and disease problems and ear infections and you, you name it. They're just a, a train wreck. And uh, we switch them immediately onto raw food and the it's never too late to make that change. So if you can start it out on your puppies and kittens, absolutely. But it is never too late to change. We have, um, uh, we have a clouder of 12 cats at the moment. It wasn't planned, but it just happened because two mamas showed up pregnant at the same time. Um, and those kittens were weaned directly onto raw feeding. And this is the healthiest group of cats I have ever had. They live mostly outside in our barn and they're allowed to come in the house if they want to. But these are the healthiest, happiest, most robust cats. They were born in April, so they're nine months old. Just mm -hmm. gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous cats. So uh, I, I, it can't be beat. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, we, we advocate this all the time. And, and the, from the point of view of the uh, how many um, breeders over there are actually still giving away these puppies and kittens, I say giving, selling these puppies and kittens with dry food still, you know, even though they might advocate raw food, they still almost have this tentative, I must give a packet of something yeah. across the counter to, to the person taking them home. We had this asked just last week. Um, so do you still get that a lot over in the States? Are you... Absolutely. Um, I, although I do like my raw feeding breeders do tend to push their puppy and kitten owners into raw feeding. But it's funny because sometimes when I talk to them, they'll say, well, I tell them I'd like them to feed raw. I'd really like them to feed raw. I recommend they feed raw. And, but I know that the majority of them are going to switch over to kibble. Mm. Yeah. So how Great prominent, time. Judy, how prominent is, is raw feeding in, in the States at the moment? And how does that compare with like five years ago, would you say? Oh, Which it's direction much are we going? Oh, we're going up, absolutely going up with the raw feeding. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think that that's part of why the big pet food conglomerates have mm -hmm. really gotten their way into the AVMA, the American Animal Hospital Association, even the CDC. And they all have these huge statements about not feeding raw food. And really, and, and we don't want to go into the whole DCM debacle that's been going on, but- A long time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you want to see steam come out my ears. Um, but really, this is all just this huge marketing ploy to get people to stop doing what is really better for their pets. Um, and it was really interesting because with that whole DCM debacle over the past few years, I looked at the statistics of the dollar value of sales for dry kibble from the, you know, with the grains and all the, the poor quality ingredients and looked at the sales level of those versus the sales level of uh, raw and grain-free, you know, the quote, better kibble. I don't know if there was such a thing. Uh, but mm -hmm. I looked at the sales levels and what was happening over a period of maybe a decade is that the raw and the grain-free were doing this. And then these typical grain, you know, crappy foods were doing this panic stations <laughs> and it was panic time and so well let's let's make a narrative let's spin something to get everybody to do this yeah and it worked brilliantly they have brainwashed the veterinary profession and i was going over notes for a consultation tomorrow i was going over them today and their dog with mitral valve disease the cardiologist said oh it also has dcm you can't feed it this raw food anymore you've got to get it back on one of these kibbles and i'm like the dog oh doesn't even God. have dcm we had to yeah. make up a disease whatever you do don't feed it lots of taurine you know <laughs> <laughs> bloody hell <laughs> it, 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 what's what's i mean we're touching on the, the dark side there and but it's only right to mention that um the fda were involved heavily with this and the fda were pushing out some pretty uh, questionable messages because during the um the melamine scandal in 2006 um the problem was that the fda knew which companies were involved and had melamine had imported melamine melamine was this 
toxic kind of version of protein that they were putting into rice meal and stuff to jack up the protein contents and the pet food companies then pretend they're using more protein unfortunately it was killing thousands and thousands of pets and cats and dogs uh, so when the fda started investigating they wouldn't name the companies for the sake of public who were buying the dry food they wouldn't name them until they knew exactly who was doing what or they'd sold their bad stock i mean okay that's a bit conspiracy that's just my opinion okay fair enough and that's the right way to do things you can't throw companies under the bus Fast forward to 2016 when the FDA got involved with grain-free pet food and they named under suspicion uh, the exact companies who they thought were causing DCM their products. Can you imagine that? And those companies are thrown under the bus and only recently the FDA admit absolutely no link from grain-free pet food, but it did the job because the Mm. grain-free sales stuttered for the first time in 10 years, 13 to 15% increase every year and then a 1% decrease as soon as the FDA. That is that is collusion. That's not good. That's bad. Well, and to add to the con- collusion, FDA just very quietly added a statement on the original uh, DCM debacle. They added very quietly added a statement that we have found no connection between grain-free feeding and DCM. And <laughs> funny, it coincides with one of the big manufacturers Ooh. buying the grain-free company's food. Oh, wow. So, so what do you do if you Ooh. want to change the dynamic? You trash their sales, trash the value of their company, you, then you buy low, and then all of a sudden say, oh, it's all good. Oh, that's dirty. My daughter came up with that dirty conspiracy dirty. theory, I and I love it. I didn't see that link. I didn't see that, but I remember it happening. I remember them buying Origin or Champion Pet Foods. Mm-hmm. And of course, now they own the cereal based pet food side of things and grain free. So you've got to stop pushing the DZM message because you own the, the biggest <laughs> grain. You own this now. They just, they just don't care what they say as long as they sell and products. And they made the FDA to quietly say, yeah, no no connection. You, you, wow. you, and what's really, what's really uh, very sad about the whole thing is that the academics were getting in on, on board oh, at yeah. the beginning. Yeah, without mentioning oh, they're, any they're names. They're still on board. It, it, uh, yeah, yeah. They wrote. You some guys top. really just want to see steam come out yeah. my ears before we're done. Yeah, don't you? yeah. yeah. <laughs> and talking of which, we should really then touch on this next hot topic of yeah. the month because yeah. everybody's got their new puppies and kittens. And you know, we we have a, a theory we've talked about immunity uh, and vaxxed in one of our previous videos. But I'd love to uh, hear uh, what's going on your side of the pond as far as best start to immunity. Where are you at with advice for puppies and kittens? So I can tell you what I recommend. Like, so when I requ- uh, retired from practice two two years ago, um, I had totally changed my vaccination protocol because I went to a Midwest American veterinary school back in the eighties. I learned traditional vaccine protocols, which are awful. And over the years, as I got more integrated and more into holistic therapies, it became just incredibly clear to me that while we are doing this completely all wrong. And so by the time I was in my last five to 10 years of practice, I had totally revamped my vaccine protocol. So instead of saying, oh, we have to start them at four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, and we have to do them every two to four weeks until they hit 18 to 20 weeks, whatever. um, Instead, I said, hey, you know what? I think if we vaccinate later and we vaccinate with less and we do single vaccines, we can get away with a lot less. And um, some studies had been done over here. Ron Schultz was big in this, uh, but started giving lower doses of vaccines and less vaccines. So I started trialing in my clinic with puppies, with holistic pet parents who really wanted to try to do things the right way. We started doing a single distemper by itself at 14 weeks a single parvo by itself at 16 weeks. And then at 20 weeks, we would do a tighter. And then we would come back a year later and do a titer just to make sure that everything was still good. We got the strongest titers that we ever got with any puppies we ever vaccinated. The cats, it, with the kittens, it's harder to find single vaccines for them. Everything's a combo. Mm. Um, so again, I had some breeders that I worked with and some uh, some people who were willing to try to go along with me and see how this would work. And we would wait on the kittens and we would do a single vaccine at 14 weeks and then do a tighter at 20. And again, much better immunity, holds longer. So all my clouder of kittens that we have now had one single distemper vaccine at about 14 weeks. And then they had one, because they're outside, they had one single rabies vaccine at about 20 weeks. 
that's all they're ever going to get for the rest of their life. Um, and they're raw fed, they're outdoors, exercising, catching wild prey. This is the life that cats are supposed to live. I get that not everybody can do that if you live in the city, whatever. Um, but this is, this is what cats are supposed to do. Uh, so I think if we start looking at those, that kind of immunity for our animals where we're less is, is more. And this is one of those cases, one of those times where absolutely less is more. That's not, not, not a not a popular opinion in the medical profession, it seems. Uh, no. So in relation to when you said the breeders hand over the, the pups and kittens with dry food, as they do over here, if they're not raw uh, fed, <laughs> kind of literate, uh, also breeders will stick in a, a vaccination into the into the puppy and say, well, like it looks good that I'm, I'm giving the jab to the pup and then the pup gets to the vet with the owner at nine or 10 weeks and the vet says, oh, I don't know what the breeder did, so I'll just start my protocol now. I don't know any vet that's ever taken into consideration that a pup got a jab at eight weeks. But even then, what is the is there any benefit at all to jabbing a pup so early? Why do the likes of yourself and Schultz recommend pushing it on? What is it that makes uh, what's well, the problem? So if your puppy is born from a healthy adult mom who had antibodies in her system against distemper, parvo, whatever, uh, she's going to pass that on in the first milk, the colostrum. And so those are the maternal antibodies. Those remain active to protect the puppies and the kittens for anywhere from eight to 18 weeks. And it is impossible to know when that maternal immunity is going to start to go down. And so what happens, the veterinarians and the breeders and everybody jump in and they say, well, you know, what happens if it starts to dive at six weeks, which it doesn't, it never has. But what happens if it starts to dive at six weeks? We better have something in so that the vaccine immunity, because we know it takes a couple of weeks, it's not instantly effective. So as the maternal is coming down, the um, vaccine is going up and then somewhere they meet and this one drops down and this one continues up. The problem is the maternal antibodies interfere with the vaccine that you give. They totally block it. So it's useless other than the fact that now you've put toxins into the puppy or kitten's body, because it's not just the vaccine particles, there's adjuvants and uh, carriers and all kinds of other things that are in the vaccines that contribute to allergies, IBD, a lot of things that we get down the line. And so some of these breeders are starting vaccines at four weeks of age, which is Whoa. God, ridiculous. Ridiculous. So can I, Judy, can I give you, have, can I give you, you my a good little... case? Yeah. Give us a case. I have this amazing case. So I was asked amazing. to consult just for, you know, like overall health things that could be done to keep this little dog healthy. The dog's like 15 months old now, and it's a tiny little 10 pound dog. And so I was like, Oh, this will be easy. Yes. I'll just jump on and make sure that she's feeding the right thing. And I get her paperwork and it says she's feeding this raw food. And I'm thinking, Oh, this is, this is going to be easy. Then I get the medical records on this puppy and hot pokers in the eyes. So at four weeks, the breeder gave a parvo. At six weeks, the breeder gave another parvo. At eight weeks, the breeder gave a, a distemper hepatitis parvo parainfluenza, so a four-way. Uh, and the puppy at this point weighs about three pounds. Um, at 11 weeks, it got another distemper hepatitis parvo parainfluenza. At 12 and a half weeks, it got that same four-way vaccine again, along with Brevecto, Strongid T, which is a dewormer, and Interceptor Plus. Then two, three days later, it got a bivalent flu vaccine. So that's two flu vaccines at 13 weeks old and the rabies and a four-way lepto and Brevecto, which it just got three days ago, but they gave it again, and Interceptor Plus. Then another... Five days later, it gets its intranasal bordetella, which is a three-way vaccine. And then two weeks after that, they come back at 16 weeks with another DAPP, another four-way lepto, another bivalent flu. The dog weighs five pounds. It got 10 vaccines in one day at five pounds. So three weeks later at 19 weeks, it comes back, it gets another four-way, another dose of Brevecto, another dose of Interceptor Plus. Three weeks later, another dose of Brevecto, another dose of Interceptor Plus. Four weeks after that, at six months old, it gets spayed. Then it gets changed over to some Parica trio. <laughs> and guess what? By the time I had my consultation with them, the dog was no longer healthy. Now, when I saw this, I said, 
this dog is like, I'm thinking, okay, my consultation just changed for this person. I have to help them prevent this dog from developing allergies, IBD, um, food intolerance. Like I'm just going through this whole litany of what this dog's been set up for. So it had 38 vaccinations by the time it was 19 weeks old. And they gave it Benadryl along with every vaccine because it's a very small dog and it's likely to react. Um, so by the time I get on my consultation with this person, oh, guess what? We've had chronic diarrhea that is unstoppable for the past six weeks, went through two rounds of metronidazole with two different veterinarians, had antibiotics for a UTI that it didn't have. Um, it has horrible anxiety. And now it is on a hydrolyzed protein dry kibble. Bloody hell. <laughs> so Judy, where do you stand? I mean, that is a litany, that's 38. Where does where where did where did the guidelines where did the professional guidelines because somewhere along the line somebody must have thought I'm I'm giving too much here. Nobody or, thought that. Or, no, <laughs> That's how, the thing that blows my mind. Nobody thought that. It's a five pound how, dog and you gave <laughs> ten vaccines at once. Is this just a is this just a single vet wow. that just uh you know who was you know going maybe losing their mind or is this like do you think this is a common feature of what's oh, going on at the moment? This is absolutely common. This is what they're taught. Give another set of vaccines every two to four weeks. I, this puppy, unfortunately, it was like every two weeks and sometimes twice a week. Um, but it is it is very common, and you're right when you say if you buy a puppy from a pet store or from a breeder and they have given previous vaccines, when you take that puppy or kitten into the veterinary office, they go, oh, no, we can't trust any of that. We have to start over. And they're going to make sure that they get their series of three or their series of four, whatever their protocol is no matter how they have to do it. So if they have to squeeze that in, I mean, they are taught that you shouldn't give them more than um, two weeks. That, like they have to be at least two weeks apart. That's nice. But they're going to squeeze them in. <laughs> like, is, there any, is there any evidence at all to suggest that, that the dog needs multiple reminders for viruses, for these, for these three or four core um, 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 jabs that we're talking about, distemper, parvo? I mean, did they get rabies more than once? They get it um, as a puppy, and then a year later, they'll get the three-year vaccine, and then they're supposed to get that every three years. But there are a lot of veterinarians, particularly in, um, I've seen it the most with uh, records from Texas, uh, where they give the three-year vaccine every year. Wow. Oh. And when I question them, that? What, well, yeah. it's funny, because one client, I said, why are you giving your dog rabies vaccine every year? And she said, I didn't know I was. I said, well, your vet is. Look at the records. Yeah. And I said, so call your vet and ask them. And when she called, he said, it's state law. So I looked it up and I said, it's not state law. Call him back again. Tell him it's not state law. Uh -huh. So then he said, it's county law. So I looked up their county and said, no. She called him back and he said, oh, well, it's our rule. And she said, why is it your rule? And he didn't have a good answer. So she switched veterinarians. Yeah. <laughs> And, and Schultz has done long-term um, challenge studies on these on these core vaccines. Um, I'm not sure if it was rabies, certainly parvo, adenovirus. I think it was seven to nine year challenge studies. So we know that the, we know that the dog has immunity, much like smallpox. We, they were measuring immunity in people 70 years later. Um, you know, initially with um, with, with uh, SARS and MERS, they were they're measuring to like 10, 15 years later. We know that immunity lasts the virus. It's the whole point of a vaccination. It's the whole point of this amazing product we once had. And like, but there's no defense. There's no studies that say you need to do it every two weeks. There's nothing no. there. Even the whole idea of every year for like, why would you do it every year? Oh, well, you get a health check as well. That's not answering the virus question. Why are you, I understand if you want to promote a health check every year, that's one thing, but don't exactly. say that your dog needs to be reminded for virus. Bacteria is perhaps something else, mm. but I mean, it's just, it's fraudulent. It's not, it's not correct. And you're paying for these jabs. It's not like they're coming in exactly. free and they're not harmless, particularly for that toy dog that we're talking about. Uh, the vaccine mm -hmm. side effects is much bigger. It, it, it's more prompt. The side effect literature is dominated by toy and small breed pups because they don't, they're not dose dependent. So this great no. Dane pup can lumber in big doofus about 30 times heavier than this little kind of Datsy pup. And he gets the same amount of vaccine. I mean, is there, is there, is there not a, is there a series of size vaccines for different sizes of dogs at all going on in the US much? Or does that happen here, lads, in the UK? It's not here either. And, and the wonderful thing is that we have vaccine companies changing their data sheet 
and then the veterinary profession isn't always following what those data sheets said. So we get the extension to three years. We get it stated quite clearly on the vaccine data sheets. If you give a vaccine after 12 weeks, you don't need to give these multiple boosters of it. And so, as Judy quite rightly said, um, you know, we've got these puppies that have often been, you know, really well fed by mums with great first milk, so the colostrum, and they've got those antibodies. They don't need that support. You know, if anything, a bit of due diligence about your, you know, when people are coming in, that they're washing their hands, they're maybe not treading their shoes in to see the puppies, those sort of things, which we call biosecurity. And actually, the rest you can just do by delaying those vaccines, as Dr. Judy said, even 14, 16, 20 weeks. You know, we talked about that before. So certainly and on this really side well of the pond. Within, within the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, the vaccine guideline says it in black and white. Vaccines given after 14 to 16 weeks can last a lifetime. It's there. It's, you know, and, and these, our colleagues need to read and and um read <laughs> yeah <laughs> even, even AHA, <laughs> AHA and avma on their websites say that the adult vaccine should be given no more often than every three to five years yet i am mm -hmm. still getting records for one-year vaccines for distemper hepatitis parvo it it it, it boggles my mind and i hate to say that it's just a money maker i think it's just people are not up to date there. I, I don't know, but I see, you know, and maybe the new grads are going into a practice that has this policy that they have to have it every year. It, it just makes no sense. And I would hope that a new grad that's going into a clinic that has these old traditional ways of doing things would open their mouth and say, Hey, you know, that's not what they're teaching anymore, but I don't know what they're teaching in the schools, but I do know that on AHVMA and AHA, it says no more often than every three to five years. It also states and the funny thing is the vaccines are licensed for one year. So that's part of the argument that you get. And I forget which one it was. I think it was um, Fort Dodge many years ago had a three-year licensed DAPP vaccine. The veterinarians wouldn't buy it. They ended up taking it off the market. It was the only one they ever actually did the research, proved that it was absolutely good for three years. It was labeled as a three-year. I think I, mine was the only clinic that ever bought it. I, they, they took it off the market after about five years. They said, we just can't sell enough of this. Everybody wants them on this label for one year so they can get people in to vaccinate them every year. And I'm like, they're Oof. not... They're, they're, they're not... Well, the wonderful <sighs> thing is those companies that did DHP or DAP... Um, have actually succeeded in this country uh, and the wonderful thing you know, beth was bringing up you know we've got vaccine companies with the pure vax range in the uk i think you've also got them over there in the states mm -hmm. you know that have no adjuvants for kittens you know again they're also extending their range over here the, the number of years are they doing that in the states too or are you yes i did finally hear because the better now that i'm not licensed to practice in the state that I'm in, I have to take my animals to a veterinarian, which is really an interesting conundrum, <laughs> let me interesting. just tell you. Yeah. Uh, and there, there are no holistic veterinarians anywhere near me. So I uh, wow. made a deal with the veterinarian that I'm using. And I'm like, I won't tell you how to practice. You don't tell me what to do with my animals. Here's what we're doing. And she's like, okay, great. So yeah. It's worked out really well, but she uses the Purevax. Um, and I said, well, I don't want you to give my animals a vaccine that's licensed for you know, a rabies vaccine that is licensed for one year, if we're going to do this at all, which I don't want after they're, I mean, they got their one, they're good. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that out loud. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I'll be> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I want something that is a three-year and I have learned that the Purevax rabies, they do now have a three-year label on the Purevax, which is good. And, and what of, uh, like, you know, you're saying it lasts for three years. It kind of sounds like there's legislation that if you don't do it, is there some sort of rules? That's the first question. And the second part of that is, are titer tests not recognized? Everyone's talking about titer tests. They seem like an enormously sensible thing to do where we measure the antibodies to see if the last, anti, the last uh, you know, jab is still there or the, the antibodies are still coursing through. And, of course, they usually find them. Uh, so titer tests seem like a very interesting way. Are, are they not, we know the top governing body was SAVA are recommending them, nobody doing them? Yeah, so for rabies, rabies over here is um, legislated in each state and each uh, county and municipality. So 
Um, almost all of them follow the national guideline, which is the first vaccine is good for one year. Any vaccine after that is good for three years. Um, and that's, that's just the law that mandates that. I have only found one or two teeny tiny municipalities who happen to have a clerk that happens to be a little more holistic, who has talked their township into saying, hey, if they bring me a titer, is that good enough? Uh, that is very, very, very rare for rabies. Uh, nothing else is mandated. Part of the problem is that we have not done a good enough job educating boarding, daycare, grooming uh, facilities to say, hey, you had a vaccine three years ago, it's still good, we're good to go, or you brought me a titer, that's good. Uh, we still have way too many of these facilities who are saying that your pet has to have their distemper, upper respiratory, parvo, influenza, lepto, blah, 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 you know, the litany goes on. And that's when I talked to the owner of this puppy, I said, uh, so what are you doing for vaccines going forward? Because we can't keep doing this. And she said, oh, well, he goes to daycare and boarding. So yeah. they require all of this. And I'm like, then you need to find another way around this because this dog is is not going to survive this. Yeah. Yeah. We have the same problem over here. Um, the insurance for these, uh, for a lot of these guys, they, they'll, you know, they're, they're switched on and they know that this, you know, um, a lot of things they don't agree with. I'm just not going to name the diseases. You guys are the vets, but they don't want to do this. They don't want to recommend it, but their insurance policy demands it. And so they're in a, they're in a tough place. Uh, they want to run the business. And so they have to insist on these things that they wouldn't put in their own dog. And it's well, like, that's a tough situation. Yeah. A lot of the pet insurance companies, we need to educate them as well, because in order to insure your pet for medical issues, whatever, they insist that your pet be up to date on vaccines and uh, what their definition of up to date is may not be my mm. definition yeah, of up to date. Totally. So that's yeah. a, another, like, we just need to do a better job educating across the board. And there are so many veterinarians who really don't understand the science behind a titer. And so in order to get around having to do it, because they don't want to admit that they, they're not comfortable with sending this test out and then interpreting results, whatever, which, by the way, the lab interprets it. So what's the big deal? Um so they just charge exorbitant fees. I mean, I have people coming to me saying, well, the veterinarian wanted $500 to do a distemper, parvo, and rabies titer. And, yeah. you know, or they'll give me the vaccine and it'll be under $50. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty big motivator yeah oh that's <laughs> awful so you mentioned you mentioned this poor old puppy uh they got a couple to to move on to your maybe um the flea and worms kind of uh, ticks <laughs> kind of questions uh what goes on where you are because like the u.s you you like you know where we are uh, in ireland britain here we don't have any mozzies so we don't have to worry about heartworm that might be an issue in your side so what about this poor pup that got a couple of flea treatments every two weeks or like where are you on all this Man, I hate chemicals. Um, and I've kind of made it my life's goal to get these isoxazoline products off the market. Um, I mean, we're not making much headway in the human space about getting bad things off the market. So, and our conversation <laughs> with the FDA about this, uh, that's another conversation. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we're all dying uh, to get into it. Our, uh, not. We actually got a conversation with the FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine, over these products a few years ago. We gave them the numbers from the EU. We gave them the numbers from that had been reported on our VAERS system. And it didn't matter that we had tens of thousands of dead animals. It didn't matter that we had tens and tens and tens of thousands of animals with uh, permanent neurologic issues, kidney failure, liver failure, you name it. Uh, their answer to us was, we just don't see enough problem yet. Yeah. Didn't, like, in 2019, <laughs> in 2019, did they not issue a warning for Brevecto and NexGuard? And, 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 and yeah, for the yeah, Isox yeah, Azulines, yeah, now it has to have a little warning on the box that says, ah. uh, be careful with seizure pets. Interestingly, what I see in notes that I get is mm. the client comes in once a month, picks up their dose of NexGuard, Brevecto, Cordelia, Semperica, whatever, along with their dose of phenobarbital, which is anticonvulsant. So they come in and they get both of them side by side. It's like, did you not read the label here? And I had a case 
with a dog that started having seizures. It had been on these monthly or every three months medications for a couple of years. Dog started having seizures. They went to the neurologist, had the MRI, the whole workup, couldn't find anything, which that's the problem with these drugs. You won't find anything. So they get classified yeah. as idiopathic epilepsy, which stinks. And so they said to the neurologist, we want to use natural flea and tick prevention. And they said, oh, no, no problem. No problem. You can use what you've been using. It's not an issue. That has nothing to do with the seizures. Oh, but don't use trifexis for your heartworm. I, again, steam. So, Is that a milbamycin? Is that a milbamycin? Yeah, it's milbamycin and yeah. spinosad together. Separately, they're not so bad. Together, they're an issue. Um so we've got neurologists who are not willing to own up to the fact that these chemicals are causing neurologic problems. Like, we're, I, I, how do we educate these people? <laughs> and does the FDA have a yellow form like we do in the UK? We have the BMD has a yellow form to report um, adverse reactions that even the owners can report in on uh, online. Do you also have something like that in the States? Yeah, so uh, the veterinarian and or the owner would have to report on the FDA website, which let me tell you, is not that easy to navigate. Uh, so mm. I think a lot of pet owners, unless they are really like down on, like I am going after them, they're not going to bother. And uh, the veterinarians, 99% of them refuse to admit that what they prescribed is related to the problems they're seeing. Um, especially if it doesn't have, like if, if, they, if you give a dose of something and they seizure within a couple of hours, the veterinarian might go, eh, maybe, but I've even had veterinarians go, it was coincidental. I had a case with a dog that was given, uh, one of those chewables in the office at its visit. And within two hours, this dog had hemorrhagic gastroenteritis needed to be hospitalized, almost died. And the veterinarian said, coincidence, not related. Yeah, like I mean, the, know, um, the wonderful uh, thing in the UK is that it's a suspect adverse reaction. So for anybody reporting over here on this side of the Atlantic, please do use that form because it actually does not have to be associated other than you've given it around the right time uh, that it could be uh, a problem. And therefore, suspect adverse reaction form is what it's called in the UK. And that's the beauty of it. It then relies on the statisticians to work out whether that then can be connected over time. Uh, so yeah, ours great is news on this side. Same. No, ours right, is actually okay. the same. If you suspect, but the problem is in order to get your veterinarian to report it, you got to get your veterinarian convinced yeah. to report it. But clients, can, pet owners can call the companies themselves because their phone numbers are on the, the packaging um, and they can report directly to FDA. But like I said, it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, so a lot of people get discouraged and it's, it's amazing. Like if the pet had a vaccine the same day that it was given that I can guarantee you the drug company is going to say, Oh no, it came from the vaccine, yeah. which really if your pet has an adverse reaction and they had multiple things done, it sh every single thing that was done should be reported as suspect. Yeah. Because it could have come from a vaccine. It could have come, I mean, for this dog, could have come from the Benadryl, could have come from any one of the 10 vaccines it got in that day, could have come from the Brevecto, could have come from the Interceptor Plus. So mm -hmm. we should report all of it. It, it seems yeah, like it, it's, sure. it seems that the uh, like you know from as the non veterinary gang here, and if you add up the amount of stuff that seems to be going wrong from recommending mm -hmm. cereal based pet food for meat eaters without a single study in support. Uh, you know, massive amounts of excessive amount of jabs, despite what the evidence clearly says, last for seven to nine years. Well, we're going to lob them in anyway. Why not? Sure, they're no harm. Well, here's side effect studies. I want to see them. And now we're talking about this terrible harm that we're seeing from flea treatments and they will not link to seizures. It's like there's an absolute refusal to like, I, I think if you take your stance, they, you know, it's, veterinary science is in a bit of a predicament here because they're no longer using evidence-based science to make decisions. A lot of the, uh, these, it seems like they're taking their, their position in like faith. They have faith in the rep and the drug and the treatment and the product they're giving. And so therefore no studies can come in and intrude, in, intrude on that faith because then it means I'm wrong and we can't have that. And then we add in the fact, particularly in the U S although it's happening over here massively as well, that Marzone's, I mean, as of five years ago, Marzone's 50,000 vets on the payroll in the US, 50,000 vets. And it's it, this is a piece in the Bloomberg and it said, if your dog comes in with an itch, um, these are the, um, this was in the Bloomberg piece, they said, um, 
the book, the pet wear manual that vets must, must abide by. And the book shows a checklist of therapies for a dog with atopic dermatitis. In other words, we're not sure why you have itchy skin. Doctors are encouraged to recommend a biopsy, analgesics, top of medications, antibiotics, a therapeutic dietary supplement, an allergy diet, and a flea control package. In bold, then they're required to recommend antihistamine, shampoo, serum allergy testing, lab work, a skin diagnostic package, because Mars owns diagnostics, anti-inflammatories. It's a treatment course that might cost $900 for symptoms, and in best case scenario, it might suggest something as prosaic as fleas. I mean, that is, that is, there's something wrong. I'm trying not to be cynical about everything. I'm trying to say, vets obviously get into this. It's such a hard job to do what you guys do. It's so hard to get into the college. It's so hard to get through that college. It is hard work. And you come out the other side and this is the result. This is terrible training. You know, what? there's a massive, massive problem here uh, that, you know, we're almost not allowed to talk about it sometimes. And it's very hard to question vets because you come in armed with this evidence and say, but the vaccine lasts this long. Or look, at here's some studies that show fresh food is important. And people meet this loggerhead jam of, well, you know, that's not what I heard. And yeah. like, well, it's not what you read, though, is it? It's not what you read. It's what you heard. It's, oh, it's brutal. So I'm biting my time so hard here that uh, I think I might bleed. Yeah. So we're into yeah. the last five to ten minutes that we've got with uh, Dr. Judy. Yeah, so I'm good. I we just... we rescheduled our other thing to a little bit later, so oh. I'm not quite the crunch that I was. So you're okay. Yeah. yeah. So I would love just to therefore touch on because uh, you must have a balance because you've got some fairly serious tick-borne diseases over in the states. Uh, I I know state by state it varies slightly. Uh, so how do you balance for your clients what they can use? for at least repelling ticks with some of those horrible diseases that you've got over there uh, versus these chemicals? Uh, so I, I don't use any chemicals for my dogs or cats, for fleas, for ticks, for heartworms. I live in the South, they're outside, it's hot, we have mosquitoes, we have fleas, we have ticks. Uh, but we have a couple of great blogs on drjudymorgan.com that talk about this. But the big thing that people, ticks are trickier then please. Um, and it really depends on the lifestyle of your pet. So if you're one of those outdoorsy people who likes to go hiking in the woods and traipsing through the high grass in the fields, you've got a bigger tick exposure than somebody like my dogs are in a fenced yard with no trees and short mode grass and not a lot of mulch and not a lot of places where ticks and fleas want to hang out. So that's the first thing. If you can keep your pets in that kind of area, great. My cats, they go in the woods, they're in the barn, they're all over the place. Um, but they don't come home with ticks partly because they are naturally healthy and they don't taste very good to the predators. So that's a huge part of it. If you keep your pet's immune system healthy, they're, even if they get bitten by a tick carrying Lyme, their immune system will go, oh, we better attack that. If they get bitten by a heartworm infected mosquito, there, there's a great YouTube video that shows a mosquito injecting the larva into an animal and then, or into, they put it in the blood, but they show the white blood cells just glomming onto this thing and attacking it, literally ripping it to shreds cool. in a few minutes. And so that's part of the issue, but I am huge on essential oil products. My dogs get garlic in their meals. It's not toxic, by the way. For kitty cats, we just use a little less, quite a bit less, but um, coconut oil works really well. We use live nematodes in the yard. Um, I had a client- What's that, Judy? What's live nematodes? nematodes? Yeah, they're, they're these wormy things. Yeah, the little wormy things, and you sprinkle them in your yard and they, uh, they destroy the eggs and the larvae and of the fleas and ticks. And so cool. part of, yeah, they're really cool. I've got clients in Florida that have just been battling fleas for years and we finally came up with the nematodes. They put them in their yard and they haven't had fleas in five years. Um, so you, you reseed the yard occasionally. Um, so there's so many things that you can do, but I had a client who has hunting dogs. She went to the nationals. Everybody went out in the field with their dogs to do their field work. And out of 100 dogs and owners coming in, she was the only one who used uh, essential oil spray on her and her dog. She used her dog spray on herself. Um, everybody else had pick a chemical. This was before the days of isoxazolines. Uh, at the end of the day, she came in with no ticks. Her dog came in with no ticks. They're pointers. It was really easy to see if they had ticks. They're a white dog with short hair. And so she had none. Everybody else came in and spent the evening picking ticks off their dogs. Guess what everybody wanted the next day when they went out in the field? Everybody came running over to me and said, do you have any more of that essential oil stuff? Because, mm -hmm. by the way, it repels. Um, so the second day, everybody went out. Well, 
most of the people went out with that on and came back with much better results. So it can work. The problem is we have become a society of convenience. And so if the veterinarian says, here, just give them this pill. It'll last for three months. You don't have to worry about it. You know what? We are having people who gave one dose of these chemicals a year later, when they find ticks on their dogs, they're still dead. This stuff doesn't miraculously leave the body in 90 days. To to steal man the argument on that, they would say that um, the likes of uh, whatever, insert nasty chemical, that when the, you know, the tick was to take a little nibble, it'll drop off dead. Uh, There is no natural treat. Is is that, A, is that true? Because I can see you shaking your head. Well, the problem is it it takes 24 to 48 hours for the tick to drop off. So for them to say, like it doesn't drink the chemical and like instantly it's dead and falls off. So for them to say that using these chemicals absolutely prevents transmission of tick-borne disease absolutely wrong absolutely 15 15 to 20 minutes of Mm. adherence they get the nibbling uh so you know you have got that's i thought i honestly believed that the only thing to be said yeah (laughs) it's not it's not um and i in practice before we had these oral chemicals we used a lot of the topical you know on the back and i would have when we first started learning about lyme disease Uh, We started testing every single dog along with their heartworm test, which is now part of the protocol in America. You get your heartworm. You also get your Ehrlichia, uh, Anaplasma, and Lyme test at the same time. It's just kind of all in one now. And we would have hundreds of dogs that would have positive Lyme tests, positive Anaplasma, positive Ehrlichia. And the clients would say, I use that stuff on his back every single month and I could prove it because I've got their records that shows they pick it up every single month and apply it and their dogs are still positive. And so then everybody's, you know, flipping out on me. Like you didn't protect my dog. I said, I never promised to protect your dog with that chemical. Like it doesn't do that. (laughs) So what, so, so it's really for, Oh God, I'm staggered at that. And so essential oils, like is one of the essential oils is rose geranium oil. That seems to be a very popular one that can, it, it seems to inhabit the dermal layers much like the flea treatments. And so that kind of suggests to me that it might last a little bit. What other essential oils do you think are top of the Judy Morgan hit list for ticks? Well, I, the thing I love about rose geranium is that's the only one that you don't really have to dilute. And so you can just put a drop between the shoulder blades and a drop on the butt and you, you got protection. Um, but a lot of the products that we have are combinations of things like lavender, lemongrass, cedar. There's a ton of different ones you can use. Um, What I will say to people who are listening, don't run out and just buy a bunch of cedar oil and dump it all over your dog. These things do need to be properly diluted. Um, But when you're looking for products that you want to use on your pets, find one that you like the smell of. Um, Mm. So some people hate cedar. I happen to love cedar. So when uh, we started, I think with cedar oil first, when I first got into doing this natural flea and tick and dogs would come in and they smell like a cedar closet. And I was like, Oh man, I love this. Love that. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, but we have some people that hate that. So I'm like, well, what do you like? Here you go. Here's your options. You've got all these different things that you can choose from. Um, interestingly, I have herb gardens at my house and I've, I've done that for probably 30 years. And my cats used to go out and just roll around in the lavender and in the lemon balm. I never mm. had food problems with my animals yeah. because they would just go out and roll around in the garden and the herbs. Yeah, I don't doubt it. Do you ship your products globally, uh, Judy? Some. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we ask when again? We... <laughs> Some. That's a very, that's a very political answer. It, it depends I'm waiting, on I'm waiting for Gwen to put the, the listing up of what we what she does yeah. send out globally on the comments uh, here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, it's an issue. Um, some countries are are not very nice about getting things in that's, Britain. that's yeah. just that's Britain. don't worry about the, don't worry about the british that's just brexit they don't like anything coming in or out that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, brexit. Well, we were oh, just, we were just told about an hour ago that the u.s is really uh, a sticky wicket for getting things in from canada oh. which doesn't yeah. surprise me yeah, although yeah. for us to get things from here to canada is also difficult so you know is what yeah. it is yeah well that's that's just, that's part of it guys we're at 10 to 8 here um uh do we should should we just nip over to bit on the side for for 10 well, minutes should we maybe well judy kindly said that she'd stay with us for a little bit yeah uh, i can give you a few more uh yeah. so best approach to neutering well this i went to a traditional midwest veterinary school in the early 1980s so it was always spay neuter at six months period no questions asked and that has been 
the dogma in veterinary medicine forever. Um, and interestingly, in another week, or two weeks, uh, we are going to really dive into this subject on our Facebook Live for a whole week on uh, options for spay, neuter, um, options for kind of leaving them intact or fully leaving them intact. Um, I had always followed what I had been taught until I started learning more. And we have so many good studies now showing that this early spay, neuter before they become mature adults and they finish growing, we're destroying their joints, we're destroying uh, hormonal systems. Uh, because when we look at the ovaries and the testes and the uterus, um, they produce hormones and they are part of a system, the endocrine system. So the endocrine system includes the thymus, the thyroid, the adrenals, the pancreas, the pituitary. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are in play. And when we remove one of those endocrine system organs, the rest of them kind of go, what the just happened there? Like, what are we supposed to do with that? <laughs> so, uh, so we've actually been causing a lot of problems. And interestingly, I have, uh, I have followers from all over the world and people from Sweden are like, why would you spay and neuter your dogs? That's silly. We don't do that over here. Um, and again, it's just because it's what we've been taught. And when you ask a veterinarian, they will give you all the lines. Oh, you have to spay them so they don't get mammary cancer. You have to neuter them so they don't get testicular cancer. Well, prostate cancer is more common in neutered dogs than unneutered dogs. Oh, you know, we have to spay them so they won't get a pyometra. Well, the survival rate in, you know, non-specialty centers for uh, pyometra surgery is like 98%. So that's kind of a bad argument, and it's not guaranteed that 100% of dogs who are not spayed are going to get a pio uh, or mammary cancer. Cats are a different story. I'm talking dogs here, folks. So kitty cats are not small dogs. Um, so we need to start looking at this differently. Like this little puppy that I was talking about who got 38 vaccines and everything else thrown at it got spayed at six months. So mm. we've just thrown everything into haywire. And then I get it with rescue organizations and shelters who want to get puppies and kittens into homes early. And so they have gone to this early spay neuter as young as eight weeks. And yes. it's a travesty. We should not be doing it. But in their defense, we used to do a lot of spay neuter for the local shelter that was a mile from my clinic. And they started out with having people pay for a voucher for the spay neuter for them to come back when the dog was six months old, and, or dog or cat, to get spayed or neutered. Only 33% of people followed through. They followed it over 10 years. 33% of people followed through. That's a horrible statistic. And if we can't count on people to be responsible with their animals, then we have a, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so for my responsible pet owners, I'm like, well, do you have a good reason why you need them neutered? Because, you know, behavior really has nothing to do with that. Uh, that's, that's a training issue. Do you have a reason, you know, always peeing in the house? Well, neutering is not going to stop that. I've got girls who mark in the house. I've got girls who mark every tree. Uh, so we need to get away from the narrative of we have to spay and neuter early so that we avoid behavior and cancer and pio and whatever, uh, and start looking at being more responsible and talking to each pet owner as their pet is an individual, particularly mm. with these large breed dogs, we are destroying their joints with this early spay neuter. Just yeah. destroying them. Do you have like, any vets over there doing this sort of ovarian sparing spay uh, procedures and things like that yet? Very or few. Or very few. So there's the Parsimus Foundation, uh, which actually has videos uh, to teach veterinarians how to do this. The problem is they're not teaching ovary sparing spay, tubal ligation, vasectomies. They're not teaching that in the veterinary schools. So nobody knows how to do that. And when you go in and ask for it, Again, if they even agree to do it, they may give you an exorbitant fee because they really don't want you to do it. Uh, because it, like Gwen wants to get a vasectomy on her male dog and he's a few years old. And the, even at the university veterinary college nearby, they were like, uh, well, we're not really sure. Uh, you are the veterinary university, <laughs> you know, yeah, is this not where people, this. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah it's that's something shocking. I teach our vets all the time to be doing ovarian sparing spays and vasectomies, it's super simple in, 
in the it's real awful. scheme of things. And it's just sort of like from, yeah, I'm always dumbfounded when people say, oh, but it's so complicated. And it's just like, no yeah. way. You just have to be a little bit more below the cervix with your um, your spay. Right. And other but than that, you know, I, I found a really interesting study because we were talking about ovary sparing spays and people being worried about PIO because um, we were saying, well, you could just do a tubal ligation. And so it came up, well, why would we do that if we could take out the uterus and eliminate the chance of having a PIO? And I found really good studies talking about the hormonal input from the uterus, not from the ovaries. The uterus is not just a dead organ laying in there. The uterus actually has a lot to do with the physiology of the reproductive tract and the endocrine system. So um, I think that we don't have enough information and we need to keep looking at this and we need to keep pushing because if we don't get the veterinary schools to teach it, we're never going to be able to, to have this happen in larger volume. It seems like a lot of my friends are uh, going for, um, well, the SNP, they would call it. And it seems to be an extremely simple, quick, easy process. I mean, you can be awake, you can be put asleep if you don't want to see the little puff of smoke as it happens and you go, oh, <laughs> there goes that part of my life. But, um, <laughs> but is it not like... And well, that's uh, when he slipped. <laughs> I, smell, I smell burning. But, um, I assume there's a little curtain or something or a big curtain. But, uh, the, um, uh, so is it not as simple uh, for dogs? Is it not just you cauterize the well, vast deferens from my biology lessons? Like, is it not that simple for you guys? Guys, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something. When in my first job, we were vasectomizing boars. I would do three boars as the boars, as in six month old uh, uh, male pigs. OK, I think if you can do it on a boar knee deep in straw, you'd knock them out with with um, pentobarbitone. That's what you could do in the old days. Yep. And you and you had to get done in. 30 minutes because otherwise they're going to start to wake up if we can do that under those circumstances i think we can do it in boy dogs like, why is Don't it so you? why 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 would they fight against that like i mean the, the operation is going to cost the same you're going to charge it the same i've been working for an hour you're going to charge out your labor at the same cost what is the advantage testicular cancer immensely survivable if that that's the one you want you know that's yeah, yeah really that's, if i gotta have one yeah uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, my my boy dogs are intact at this point um i have a, a spayed female who was not spayed until she was four um because she was a breeding dog and then when i rescued her i said oh yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a good enough owner to have girls in heat and boys running around so you know yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. yeah everybody has to figure out where their their yeah. divide is um mm -hmm. so uh you know my boys are going to stay intact there's no reason for them not to be yeah yeah totally yeah. And, yeah. and we we are massively discussing on the human side you know going into menopause you know it's becoming a, a thing that everybody should know about all of you gents should know about and uh um uh, and i always say to people you know look, shocking those female dogs into menopause yeah, you're going to have problems. You've oh, got to yeah. really seriously think if you're going to go down that route of taking mm -hmm. that those ovaries away. So I always say that's, you know, unless there's Ooh. some major issues going on, do think hard about leaving at least ovarian tissue behind. So does that, don't get does that the, are you saying, Brenda, that, that would happen instantaneously or is that like over time or how do you think this is oh, a... well if you're taking away the ovaries which are producing those estrogens for the body i mean yeah. you're you're effectively shocking them into They're menopause gone overnight. So rather than yeah rather yeah. than it being a slow decline never thought right. of that and the same with the neutering the boys the testosterone is gone in 24 hours and what we see very commonly when we spay or neuter uh, particularly in the big dogs at middle age or older within a couple of months, they're hypothyroid as well. Because yeah. again, mm -hmm. the endocrine system doesn't work one at a time. They all yeah. work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the thyroid epidemic. Uh, and that would be the same for any mammal. I mean, to some degree, that's the same for, uh, you know, the female cats as well. I know Beth's out there again, just trying to shout out for cats. And, you know, we've got to, yeah. got to give the little cats a, li a little bit of a, a air time tonight. Um, but it is one of those things that you've just, you know, there's different diseases, as Judy said, with regards to cats and different processes, and certainly for female cats that can continually cycle um, uh, unless mated, and that's you know can become uh, real problems for them, and also for the male cats, uh, there's various uh, issues too. That uh, it's great if you've got outdoor cats, I think, um, far more, but they do fight a lot, and there are lots of diseases they pass to each other that we can't 
necessarily treat over here. Do you have an FIV vaccine over there? Or I don't are think they... it, we did. No, I don't think did. it's available yeah. anymore. The same with FIV. Right. Really cool. uh, I mean, my, yeah. my outdoor kitties are all spayed and neutered. Um, because that does keep them out of trouble. But we live in a really isolated area. The only cat they might come into contact with is their dad, <laughs> who uh, he hadn't shown up for months. And then the other night he showed up at our back door and he looks much better. I think somebody took him in and neutered him and he, lo he looks great now. So Time away from the kids, I suppose. <laughs> you know? ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Connor, Elaine's months. watching tonight. Be careful what you say. Especially if it's 12 months <laughs> or whatever, whatever the number is for 12. There's a great question from Katia. If you had a male and a female, which would be the least damaging to neuter? Whew. Which would you do? Ooh. Which would you pick on? Well, in my house, I did the girl. Um, it would t depend on breeds. It would depend on ages. Um, yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's a tough question. Is there many people I do who an do ovarian people... sparing spay on the female? I was just gonna say, there you is... go, ovarian sparing yeah. spay on the female. Is there many, pe many people doing what you're doing, Bren, in Tara Wood? Is there many, uh, Nick, did you ever do it in practice because you're doing it on the pigs? Yeah. So, how many vets in the UK are doing it, lads? Well, we've got four. <laughs> okay, I think that's the only four. No, four in, four in your county. <laughs> but uh, if you look up and down the country, four there are practice. not that many people. I send people up to Bren from London, from south of England. Yeah, yeah? and so and and they're, they're probably going past several thousand vets to in order to get to Bren's. But yeah. you know, there is a Facebook group, the OSS over sparing spay. There's a the source of information there. If you're going to find somebody, you'll find it on there. But I. I just don't think why they're doing it. I mean, you know, for the first, your first 20 spays, that's pretty complicated. And it's going to be exactly the same for ovary sparing spay, isn't it? You know, the yeah. first 20 is going to be a little bit tricky. Then you can do them in your sleep yeah. after that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's yeah, how it works. Hundreds now. I think we've, yeah. we've probably had three that we've had to go back and uh, remove cystic ovaries um, over the years. But, you know, we've done hundreds over the last, uh, probably getting on for 10 years now. Yeah, the, new, the, 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 the new to be an overpopulation thing, it doesn't hold because if you think about it, Ireland, UK, US, aggressive neutering policies, and we've got as many pounds and chowders as you can shake a stick at. We have a mm -hmm. dog overpopulation problem and we're slaughtering them. In Scandinavia, consider the practice a little bit barbaric and Ireland sends its unwanted dogs to Scandinavia. You know, so we're the ones that are neutering Ooh. aggressively. Surely we should have less dogs. I mean, if an alien yes. was to come down yes. and assess how's neutering working out for you, well, it seems to have the opposite effect, you know, because <laughs> only only responsible pet owners go and do it. And the and the and the people that, you know, where you know, the puppy farmers, because Ireland's a big producer of excess pups, because we tax incentivized farmers and people that invested their money uh, poorly in 2008, 2009 crash. And the government said, I oh, know, sure, we'll just breed pups and sell them to britain you know and so we had this massive puppy farming issue uh and we just got this big dog overpopulation problem and a neutering policy that is just not working it's just ridiculous it's not working to stop we've got 200 pounds in shelters screaming for handouts to help them as they bring in pups into their house and home dogs into their house to look after them it's not working you know so uh why don't you know it's just another facet of 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 uh, veterinary medicine that doesn't seem to be moving along you know the slip at least for boys i mean my god it just seems so obvious you know any last any last thoughts judy that uh you know, what any last uh, kind of thoughts from yourself what's the what's the hot project at the moment there are so <laughs> many hot projects going on i think the hospice course getting launched next week is probably where i'm gonna have to be focusing uh in the next week uh but getting uh the books out for this year is yeah, really huge big... um yeah. so just so much stuff and i'm back on the road with speaking so we are yeah. kind of arranging a speaking tour i have a podcast that's going to come out uh in another month or so i mean that's exciting cool. stop yeah and we're gonna we're gonna see you in may in birmingham in so may very yeah. in may in birmingham that, um, along yeah. with my husband my mother and good Great. friends <laughs> oh, it's like the, it's like the, it's like the, uh, what is it, the traveling wheel? No, who's the, who was it, the family that the used Waltons. to travel? No, the family that used to have the wheelchair oh. on the roof. Do you remember the Beverly, the Beverly Hillbillies? Do you remember there that? You go. <laughs> God, I hope we don't look that bad when we come in. <laughs> 
yeah. Anyway, not the Beverly Hills. That's the wrong thing to be saying to Dr. Judy Morgan. <laughs> Bloody hell. It's oh, it's but fun. thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, that was Dr. great. Dr. Judy, it's been well, brilliant. Thank you Absolutely for the invitation. You. You, guys, you guys are a lot of fun. Yeah, that was great. Great. We'll see you again, it's Judy. Been Good luck with everything that you're doing. Thanks for everything you're doing, Judy. We we follow you and uh, and love everything that you're putting out. And your your uh, Facebook page is brilliant. I recommend everybody to check it out. The quality you. uh, of your content is very high and it does put... I put a lot of pressure on myself and I don't want to feeling bad and I want to pick a sore tooth. I look at your page and go, damn, look how lovely your images are. Look how good your content is. Your interviews are great. It's, it's all Gwen's fault. Well, yeah, there you go. I need a Gwen. So. And I will not give you Gwen. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Is she not coming across in May? Yeah. Uh, Throw money she at her. will be in Italy at oh. the wedding of one of our employees at the same yeah. time. So nice. yeah, it didn't work wow. out. <laughs> wow, there you go. Very nice. Appar nice apparently Naturally Healthy Pets is going to have a skeleton crew that week. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Cool. Judy, thanks so much for having that was yeah. great. Guys, you'll find us on patreon.com forward slash raw pet medics. Uh, uh, we deeply appreciate all the support that's coming in there. That's fantastic. Uh, I don't even know what we've lined up for next week, guys, but uh, whatever it is, I'm sure it's going to be super awesome. We'll just uh, announce it in due course over the next few days. Uh, any final words, guys, before we, we toddle on? No, no just a big thank, thank you, you to, to, to Dr. Judy. Superb, just uh, great content with, with a really charming, cheeky delivery. We love it. There you go. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, cool. Thank Good you. luck. Take it easy, great guys. Stuff. Thanks Take care. Bye-bye.